I'm uh, excited about being here a couple days before Christmas. I mean, Christmas is right around the corner. And if you haven't got your shopping done, I'm sure you're going to be dealing with all the hustle and bustle and running around with everybody else because that's how life goes. And Christmas is an important holiday to most Christians, right, for centuries. But the question is why? You know, why do you celebrate Christmas? Now, most people celebrate it because it's just tradition. It's something that we've done for centuries. It's something that is just normal. But I think that as believers, we should always evaluate the motives in which we live. Like, why do we do what we do? Why do we say what we say? Why do we act the way we act? I think that it's becoming of us as believers to always be growing in our faith and growing in our knowledge and even understanding who God is and then how that impacts us and then how we should live accordingly because of who he is. Christians have celebrated Christmas Day since the 4th century. It wasn't always that way. But we exchange gifts, we decorate Christmas trees, we put up lights, we attend church, we spend time with family, sharing meals with our friends. And and so there's all these things that we've done together as uh, believers to celebrate Christmas. Christmas became a federal holiday in the United States in 1870. It wasn't a holiday for us until 1870 as a country. And it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way because there have always been different celebrations, different festivals that took place, often pagan, during the winter months. The Romans celebrated the birthday of Mithra. And Mithra was uh, the god of the unconquerable sun, believed to be born from a stone, an infant god that the Romans worshipped as sacred. And they believed that December 25th was the most sacred day of the year because they believed that it was Mithra's birthday on that day. So it was already celebrated as a holiday for a pagan god before we ever celebrated as Christians for Jesus. So in the early years of Christianity, Easter was the main focal point, right? It was about the resurrection, the main holiday for all believers. The birth of Jesus was not celebrated up to the 4th century. And there are reasons, right? If you talk to a Jehovah Witness, they'll say, ah, we don't, you know, keep track of our birthdays. We don't celebrate Christmas because they don't believe in birthdays. Because the Bible doesn't deal with or talk about birthdays. I mean, they're not in there. You look throughout the Bibles, there are no dates, no times. The only birthday that was ever celebrated was the birthday of Pharaoh, and he was a pagan. So birthdays were kind of off limits uh, to the Christians, and that was a fact that the Puritans later pointed out after the Reformation. They didn't believe that the celebration of of Christmas was a good thing for Christians, or that it was legitimate. Pope Julius I chose December 25th to celebrate the birth of Christ in the fourth century because, and there were many reasons of speculations of why, uh, most believe that it was an effort to absorb and adopt the traditions of the pagan festivals. Just bring them all together for December 25th and we'll celebrate the birth of Christ because we know that Christ wasn't born in December. Most likely he was born sometime in April because there was shepherds in the field and there wouldn't be shepherds in the field if it was in the middle of winter. There's no way that they would be out there in the snow. First, when Christmas was celebrated, it was called the Feast of Nativity. That's the way they uh, used it. And by 432 A.D., it had spread all the way through Egypt, all the way into England. By the end of the 6th century, everybody throughout all of England had celebrated or was celebrating Christmas. By the 8th century, it had always spread to Scandinavia. I mean, it was moving and growing, and it was a great holiday. Even today, there are many who celebrate Christmas in different forms or different fashions. You know, the Greek and Roman uh, Orthodox churches, they celebrate what we call Three Kings Day or the Epiphany 13 days after Christmas. So they celebrate on January the 7th because that's supposedly the time the three wise men found Jesus. So that's when they celebrate Christmas. But literally in, you know, the early foundations of America from 19, I mean, from 1659 all the way till uh, 1681 for 22 years, Christmas was outlawed. 
So there was no celebration of Christmas uh, in the United States, especially starting in Boston. Because the Puritans who came here from the Reformation didn't believe it was a godly thing to do. When I first became a believer, I was a pagan, of course, right? You're a pagan, then you come to Christ. So I didn't know anything about God. So I come to Jesus, and then I, I see all the commercialism in Christmas, all the holiday lights, and all the money being made. And so I began to question early on in my beliefs, early, should I celebrate Christmas? And almost as a very young believer, I almost cut it all out for my kids, like, no, we're not going to do Christmas, we're not going to have trees, we're not going to do lights, because it's pagan. And then I began to wrestle with that, really, really challenging, you know, like, what is Christmas really about? And should I, as a Christ follower, celebrate Christmas? You know, it was declared a, a national holiday June 26, 1870. And Christians for centuries have celebrated Christmas, so should I. Which I believe is the ultimate question for all of us. Why do we do what we do? Because a lot of people just go with the norm. Well, you know, I grew up celebrating Christmas. Everybody celebrates Christmas. So we celebrate for different reasons. But the most important question is why do you celebrate Christmas? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Why do I celebrate Christmas? Why is Christmas important to me? And, and I came to some realities when I was asking why do I celebrate Christmas? Well, first, I celebrate Christmas because our hope is in Christ alone. There is no other hope apart from Christ. When you look at the Christmas story, it unfolds the message of hope. I mean, beginning in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, you have to understand, betrothed means engaged, right? In the Eastern days, if you were betrothed to someone, you were literally married. Even though you weren't married yet, the marriage hadn't been consummated, you had to have a divorce in order to separate. It was a legal and binding contract that you entered into, usually arranged by families. Once that happened, the only way you could depart from that would be through a, a legal divorce. So Joseph finds out that his wife is pregnant before they've been together. He's alarmed. Who wouldn't be? So the natural thing is like he would divorce her. But look at the character when we talk about hope of Joseph. The text goes on to say, And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Man, he could have thrown her out. But he didn't want to shame her. Talking about character? I mean, she's pregnant. He doesn't think it's mystical or magical. He doesn't believe. He just knows she's telling him that she's pregnant. And he resolves in his heart. You're talking about character? Who would do that? Knowing that if he divorced her, she'd be marred for life or stoned as an adulterer. But his character was so strong and so great that he chose he was going to divorce her quietly. So the next verse says, But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Man, God revealed to him at just the right time because God is always on time. God is always on time. He knows what we need and when we need it. He knew exactly what Joseph needed to hear. He needed to hear the truth so that he wouldn't divorce her, so that he would stay with her. God is faithful in all things, and he provides hope when we feel hopeless. The next verse is a prophecy from Isaiah seven fourteen. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a verse ahead. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And this is the prophet Isaiah, who prophesied years before. 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Tell my hope. This is the incarnation. This is God wrapping himself in flesh to meet us where we are because we're sinful, because we need a Savior. And Jesus is our only hope. He alone is worthy of our admiration, worthy of our time, worthy of our thought life, worthy of all that we have to offer him. I mean, when you wrap your mind about God with us, the, the reality, Emmanuel, God with God in the flesh, the one who hung the stars, the moon, the planets, created the universe with us, walking with us, teaching us, loving us, dying for us. God with us. And not only is he with us, but he's in us. If you're a Christ follower, he not only lives with you, but he is in you. And that is beyond comprehension. We can't even conceive what that really means, that God is in me. The one that created the galaxies, that hung the sun, lives in me. So when I think about celebrating Christmas, the first reason is because my only hope is in Jesus. Listen, I can't save myself. You can't save yourself. Muhammad won't save you. Buddha won't save you. Religion won't save you. Only Jesus can save you. Our hope is in Christ alone. He is the only way. He is the Savior of the world. He's our only hope. Not only is there our own hope, but because everybody needs Christ. Everybody needs Christ. I don't care who you are, where you're from, or where you've been. Everybody needs Christ because nobody can save themselves. Nobody can be good enough. We strive to be good. How many of you said, I'll never do that again? Only to find yourself doing it again. We have this tenacity. We are drawn towards sin because we have a sinful nature. And so because we're drawn to sin, we have this capacity, this desire to sin. It's natural for us. And that's why we need a Savior. For all the reasons that I celebrate Christmas, it's because Christ is the centerpiece to Christmas. Because he is a Savior, and I am a sinner. And every sinner needs a Savior. When Matthew said, she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It was a prophecy from Isaiah 7, 14. Because Jesus is the Savior of the world. There is no salvation apart from Jesus. Nobody can come to God apart from Jesus. John 6, says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him. Our salvation is in Christ alone. It's what he did for us. He imputed his righteousness on us. That's what justification means. We were imputed as righteous even though we're unrighteous. Is anybody here godly? Is anybody here righteous? Apart from Christ, we are nothing but sinful. That's why Paul said, nothing good lives within my sinful nature. That's why the apostle said, for all have sinned. How many is all? All. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We miss the mark. No matter how good you are. And you might like good. You might look real good according to your spouse or according to your neighbor or according to your coworker. You might look better. But you're still not good. None of us are good. We are sinful at our core. We have a tenacity, a propensity towards sin. We are drawn to it. And that's why Jesus died. That we might be set free. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. Look, when we talk about death, we're not talking about physical death here. It's talking about spiritual death. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. God said to Adam and Eve, when you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. Well, they ate of the tree. Did they die? Did they just fall over dead? Yes. Not physically, but spiritually. Death means separation. That's what it means, separation. 
They were put out of the garden, out of the presence of God. They were separated from the presence of God. When you are born, you are born sinful. You are born dead in your sin, and you are separated from the life of God. That's what that means. There is ultimately physical death as a byproduct of sin, but that's later. Everybody born is born spiritually dead, and then eventually we physically die because death is separation from your body. It's your spirit and your body are separated when you die, and none of us are getting out of here alive. So we need Jesus physically and spiritually. We need him for every aspect of our life because he's the only hope that we have. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. And that's why it's a gift, because you can't earn it. Listen to me. Going to church won't get you to heaven. You can go to church your whole life and die and go to hell. There are many in this country that go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and have no relationship with God. They might have a religion, but they don't have a relationship. A relation is something that you live in community. God wants us to abide in him, for him to abide. It's about community with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's about walking hand in hand because there is no salvation apart from him. Acts chapter 10 verse 43 says, All the prophets, all of them in the past, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives Forgiveness of sins. The moment you put your faith in Jesus, you are forgiven. You are justified. God imputes his righteousness onto you because of your faith in Christ. Not because you did something special. Not because you prayed a prayer or walked an aisle or signed a card. But because you put your hope in Jesus. And when you put your faith in him and you love him, you follow him. The word disciple and Christian are synonymous. Not in our culture. People say, yeah, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. But they don't say they're a disciple. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm working on that. I'll become a disciple later. No, no. If you're a follower, if you're a believer, you're a disciple. They're the same. That's why Jesus said in Luke 14, if anyone does not give up everything he has, he cannot be my disciple. Knowing Jesus means pledging your allegiance to Jesus, realizing that he alone is worthy of all that you are, all that you will ever be. And so you give him your whole life. Why? Because he died for you. And because he's your only hope. He's the only source of salvation. I love this passage. Romans chapter 5. Verses 6 through 8 says, for while we were still weak. The NIV says, while we were still sinful. While we were still weak at the right time. Why? Because God is always on time. At the right time, Christ died for the godly. Is that what it says? No. Christ died for the ungodly. Why? Because we're not godly. Because we're dead in our sin. Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us. You ever question the love of God? You ever think, man, God just doesn't love me. I mean, he loves everybody else, but he doesn't love me. I mean, things never go my way. Man, that's a crock. He loves you. He displayed his love for you. He demonstrated by dying on the cross. Jesus demonstrated his love for you by stretching out his arms and dying for your sins so that all your sins might be washed away, so that you might be forgiven and free. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's why the apostle said in Acts chapter 4, Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other way. There's no other name given under heaven by which men must be saved. And I know that's difficult for some of you. Because you think, well, what about all these people that worship Buddha? What about all these people that worship Muhammad? What about all these people that love Allah? What about them? Look, Jesus is the only way. He is the only way. 
He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, not your kids, not your grandkids, not your neighbors, not your coworkers, no one comes to the Father but by me. No one, unless they come through me, they don't come. And that's why it's critical at Christmas that we share the message of Christ. Christ is the centerpiece to civilization. He's the Lion of Judah, the Prince of Peace, the Rock of our salvation. We should be proclaiming Christ not just on December 25th, but 365 days a year. Christ should be proclaimed by the way we live our lives, by the way we love people. Because we're all dead in our sins. That's what cracks me up about believers. Just how people can look down at other believers. It just blows my mind. Because we look at somebody and, and we think, I can't believe they would do that. Like we're better than them. The Apostle Paul said, there go I but the grace of God. If it wasn't for God's grace, you wouldn't be who you are. You wouldn't be able to do what you do. All the capacity you have to live a righteous life, to do the right thing, is because of God's grace. It has nothing to do with you. But yet somehow we want to make it about ourselves. We want to make it about our own disciplines, our own will, our own choices. But the truth is, if it were not for the grace of God, you wouldn't even know God. That's the truth. So who are you to look down on anybody else? You can't. Not logically or theologically. You can't look down at others when you're on the same place. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, you wouldn't be where you are. You are where you are because of his grace. We owe him everything. We owe him everything. All of our allegiance, all of our time, all of our thought life, all of our ambitions, he deserves. If you have your Bible, I want to read you just one little quick passage because it's so beautiful if you have a bible with you and you want to read it because i didn't put a slide in here but i just wanted to add this because it's one of my favorite passages about true salvation i mean what it really means to understand titus in the clean part of your bible titus chapter 3 verses 4 through 7 probably the one with no marks in it it's towards the back of your bible before you get to hebrews uh it says this but when the goodness and loving kindness of God. Titus, all right, if you're reading it with me, chapter 3, verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior appeared. When did it appear? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. It appeared. It's the incarnation. It's why we celebrate Christmas. When the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us. You didn't save yourself. Nobody else saved you. He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy. But according to His own what? Mercy. Say that with me. Mercy. According to his own mercy. It wasn't because you're good or better than your neighbor or better than your child or better than your spouse or better than your cousin. It had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with God. Not works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Pre-sanctification is when God draws you. The Holy Spirit draws you. We call that pre-sanctifying work of the Spirit. So God draws you. And then he saves you. The Holy Spirit gives life to your spirit so that you can understand spiritual things. A dead person can't give life to himself. Somebody outside of the dead person has to bring life, has to give life to the dead person. That's exactly what God does. He saves us. The Holy Spirit awakens, gives life brings to life our spirit. And then it says, whom he's poured out on us richly. Why? So that we can have the Holy Spirit, so that he can live in us and guide us and teach us and direct us. So that we can surrender to him, so that we can follow him. And being justified by grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I just want you to think for a minute. Anybody here ever made a bad decision? How about a bunch of them? 
right? All of us would say, yes, I've made many bad decisions. I've done stupid things. But yet God, knowing all that, seeing your craziness, still chose to make you co-heirs with Christ. I mean, think about that. That one day we're going to rule and reign with Christ. It's unbelievable. Like, why would God do that? That's how much he loves us. That's how great his grace is. That in all of our mess-ups, in all of our bad choices, he still loves us. He still uses us. And one day we will reign with Christ because we are his. See, I celebrate Christmas because of who he is and what he's done. Not because it's cultural, not because everybody else does it, but because of Jesus himself, because of who he is. Again, behold, the virgin shall conceive, and she shall have a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Listen to me. Did you realize that God was with you this morning when you got up? Did you realize that God was with you when you drove here? Did you realize that God was with you when you walked through those doors? Do you realize that God is with you right here, right now? That God is with you, and he's not only with you, he's in you. The reality that God is in you, that God wants to work through you, is beyond comprehension. I mean, it's mind-blowing. To think the God who created the sun and the stars and the planets and the galaxies and the universes, the God that big lives in me, lives in you. And he wants to work through you. He wants to use you for his glory and for his honor. He's got reasons why he saved you that are beyond us. Your job is submit to him. Why don't we want to submit to him? Why do we want to be our own God? We have such a great God. You see, if Christmas is anything, it's about Christ. It's about realizing that he deserves all that we are, all that we will ever be. And he should be the center of our day, 365 days a year. Not just on December 25th, but every day of every year. You know, one of my other reasons why I celebrate Christmas, for me, personally, is because of the reality that he will never leave me. Think about that. He not only saved me, he not only wants to work in me and through me, but he will never leave me. He'll never leave me. Ever. Hebrews 13. The author starts off, and it seems kind of funny when you first read this. He says, keep your life free from the love of money. And you're like, Why? What, what is that? What is that about? Well, where do we find our confidence? Where do we find our security? In our money, right? In our money, in our wealth. We find security, we find confidence. And the more we have, the more secure we feel. So there's this false security that comes from wealth. So we build it, we build it, and we build it. We want to stockpile it. We want to have a great retirement plan. We want to have a great 401k, we want to make sure that we are set because our security is in the world and not in Christ. So the author of Hebrews says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content. Why? Because contentment comes from confidence. If your confidence is in Christ, you'll be content. And be content with what you have. For he has said, I, and this is why, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But we're so busy trying to build our bank accounts, trying to build for our future, that we forget while we're here. I will never leave you. I will never, that's our hope. That no matter what you face, no matter what trial or tribulation, that will come. And they're going to come. 2020 is right around the corner. 2020 will be here before we know it. And you're going to have trials and tribulations and struggles and sicknesses and conflicts. They're going to come. And if you put all your hope in your finances, your career, your wealth, it'll let you down every time. 
But if you realize, if you believe that he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you, and your hope is in him, that's consistency. That's contentment. That's confidence. Because you know that no matter what you go through, Jesus is right with you. He's not going to take you out of it. He's not going to rescue you every time, but he'll walk with you through it. Hand in hand, heart in heart. He will carry you through whatever you face. That's why the author says, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Listen to me. When you believe this truth, you say goodbye to anxiety. You say goodbye to worry. You say goodbye to fear. Because your hope isn't in this world. It's in Jesus and Jesus alone. And so what do you got to worry about? If the Lord is your helper, what can man do to you? What can anybody do to you? Nobody can harm you unless he allows it. You're not going to lose everything. If you do, it's okay. Because he'll be with you. No matter what you face, no matter what you experience, he is the source of all your joy. You see, one of the issues I have with American Christianity is that we've replaced joy with stuff, that we've replaced peace with happiness. God doesn't care if you're happy. He wants you to have real peace. He wants you to have real joy. But we want everything to be the way we want it to be. That's why Paul said in Romans 8, 31, I mean, he laid it out for us. He said, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Your assurance and your confidence is in Christ and in Christ alone. That's why he said in Romans 8, 35, he said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation the trials that you go through, will they separate you from the love of Christ? No. Or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. No. An emphatic no. That's why he says in verse 37, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. More. What's more than a conqueror? What is more than a conqueror? We are more than conquerors. Through him who loves us. Look, we are forgiven and we are free. But we don't walk in our freedom. We get bound up and trapped in sin. Christ came not only to forgive us, but to set us free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Galatians 5 1. Jesus said, Whoever the Son sets free is free indeed. John chapter 8, right? He wants us not only to be forgiven, but to walk in real freedom. And unless your hope is in the reality that he will never leave you and never forsake you, you're always going to be searching for other things. But like Jesus is right here. He's always with you. He will never leave you no matter what you go through. He won't pull you out of it, and that's what we want. We go through an illness, we go through a circumstance, we go through a trial, and we want God to rescue us. We want him just to pull us out of it. We're like, God, save me. But he already has saved you. This life is temporary. Your life is but a vapor that appears for a little while, then it's gone. It's temporary. Your trials are temporary. This too shall pass. You say, Scott, you don't know what you're talking about. I got cancer. Well, it's temporary. Because if it takes you out, it's temporary. It's not going to last forever. And you'll be with Jesus. What happened to live as Christ but to die as gain? What happened to that? Why don't we think that way? That's biblical. That's a biblical perspective to live as Christ, but to die as gain. If we're alive, it should be all about Jesus. And if we're dead, praise God, because we're going to be with Jesus. But we want to hold on. We want to hold on as long as we can to what we have. And we forget that we are more than conquerors. Paul said in verse 38, for I am sure, think about this, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation. 
nor anything else in all. How much is anything else? It's anything else. Nothing. Anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Our Lord. I am most thankful that God will never leave me and never forsake me. Not only will he never leave me and never forsake me, he'll always be at work in me, transforming my heart and mind. Listen, you don't have to live this year in fear or worry and anxiety. You don't have to. You can choose to trust him. See, when you trust him, that removes the anxiety, that removes the fear, that removes the worry. Psalm 1, what is it, 119, verse 165. One you might want to memorize. Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Those who love your teaching will find perfect peace. Those who love your teaching will find perfect. Don't you want peace? I mean, think about it. Don't you really want peace and joy so that when you lay your head down at night, man, there's nothing to worry about, nothing to fear, nothing to struggle with? That you have real peace, that you experience real joy. I mean, that's what Christmas is all about. Peace that no matter what I experience, man, he is with me. And he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. And I am more than a conqueror. I am free. I'm not bound by my struggles. I'm not bound by my issues. I'm not bound by my worries. I'm not bound by fears. I am free because Christ has set me free. And I want to walk in that freedom. And I want you to walk in that freedom with me. I want us to experience Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, that's what Christmas is all about, experiencing Christ in you, the hope of glory. I mean, Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, everybody knows this verse, right? You should, right? If you're a Christ follower, you know this verse. I mean, Jesus clearly says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He wants to offer us rest. How many people are anxious about getting the right Christmas gift, getting all their shopping done? How many people are worried about the house looking the right way or the way everything has to fall into place or how this is going to happen and that's going to happen? Man, you can say goodbye to worry and you can say goodbye to fear and you can say goodbye to anxiety if you put your hope, if you put your trust in Jesus. It's about trusting in him, loving him. One of the greatest things is that he's not done with us. He is still sanctifying us. That's, that's one of the greatest things I love about Christmas is the reality that God is not done with us. He didn't just save us just so we can go to heaven. He saved us so he could use us in the world. But if you exclude yourself from the world, how is he going to use you? You're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. He wants to use you for his glory and for his honor, to represent him as an ambassador. That's what 2 Corinthians says, that we are his ambassadors. God is using us to share his love with the world. And if we're just like everybody else, we live with worry just like everybody else then we're not different and honestly how many people here would honestly say yeah, I struggle with worry I struggle with fear I struggle with anxiety I, I get stressed out I've been stressed out all week I'm gonna be stressed out next week I'll be stressed out Christmas morning why what's the point where's your hope really at is your hope really in Jesus or it is in your circumstances. Where is it really at? So you got to ask yourself, why do you celebrate Christmas? So I'm going to close with uh, 1 John 5.20, and then I'm going to give you two verses that I'm going to ask you to memorize. 1 John 5.20. So I'm going to give you two verses that I want you to meditate on, easy verses, for Christmas. Just get up and meditate on them in the morning, but I want you to hear this verse. And we know that the Son of God has come, right? That's why we celebrate Christmas, because he's come. 
and has given us understanding so that. When you see the word so that, what is that? It's a purpose statement, right? It's there to tell you why. So you got to understand that when you read this, so that, here's why. So that we may know him. This is an intimate relationship. Who is true? Jesus came and gave us understanding so that we can walk with him, so that we can know him. And not only so that we can know him, who is true, and we are in him, who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life. Life is synonymous in the Bible with eternal life, abundant life. The life that we should be living should be abundant. It should be filled with joy and peace. And because we don't get our way, we lack joy and peace because we want our way. Think about it. You get frustrated because you're not getting your way. That's why we get frustrated because it's not going the way you thought it should or the way you thought it would, and you're not getting what you want. So you get frustrated. You get angry. You get anxious. Those are all byproducts of a lack of surrender, a lack of really following Jesus. Letting him be Lord. I mean, he's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings, right? He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is Jesus. Let him rule your life. Let him reign in you, and you will have true peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast on me. He'll keep you in perfect peace if your thoughts are focused in on Jesus and he's the only one worthy of all your thoughts. Jesus. So I want to give you two verses. They're easy. And I want you to meditate on them all the way through Christmas. Maybe you'll memorize them, all right? 1 John 5, 12, and 13. They're really easy verses and I really want you to meditate on them. I want you to think about them because they're critical for us as believers. Whoever, verse 12, has the Son, all right, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever has the Son has life, and whoever does not have the Son does not have life. There is no in between. You either have a relationship with Jesus, you are walking with Jesus, you are growing in Jesus, or you're not. There is no in between. You either have him or you don't. Pretty simple. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son does not have life. And then he says in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe. I write these things to you who believe. In the name, not just believe, but believe in the name of the Son of God. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Because when you know that you have eternal life, you have peace. If you were to walk out of here today and get hit by a bus, do you know without a shadow of a doubt that when you closed your eyes for the last time in this world, that you would open your eyes to Jesus in his presence, face to face? Do you know for certain that when you take your last breath, when your heart stops, that you're going to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Man, I'm so pleased. You loved me and you followed me and you surrendered your life to me for my glory, for my honor, for my namesake. Because if you don't, you need to turn Give yourself to Jesus. You need to cry out to Jesus, Lord, help me, fill me, change me, use me. God, I'm yours. I mean, that's the key is saying, God, I'm yours. Just use me for your glory. That's what this life is about. 
It's about bringing him glory, and that's why we're here. We're not here for ourselves. It's not about us. We make Christmas about us, but it's not. It's about Jesus. Jesus is truly the reason for the season. Will you pray with me? Lord, my heart is heavy. I want to be surrendered to you, Father, in every area. I want to bring glory and honor to your name, and I struggle, and I fail, and I fall. I need help from you. I need more grace, God. I want to be undivided in my attention for your glory. And I want the same thing for my brothers and sisters here. To be undivided in their attention for your glory. For your namesake, God. That we might live for you and you alone. God, give us grace. Draw us close to your heart. Because only you can change us. Only you can work in us, Father. Only you can transform our hearts and our minds. God, help us to grow in your word so that we can know you intimately, to seek you, to love you. God, I pray that this Christmas would really be about you, not about the gifts and the lights, but about your love and about your grace that we might be your witness before the world, that the world might see Jesus in us. Father, use us for your glory and for your namesake. In Jesus' name, amen.